So good morning, everybody. Um, so today we, we are going hopefully to, to complete our discussion about prototypes. Um, and so yesterday we, we stopped here with the stark definition, the distinction between law and high level prototypes and we stopped here saying that there could be various characteristics of prototypes, of different kind of prototypes. This is not, uh, let's say, official taxonomy or official characterization is just not official, so we, we won't spend too much time on this structure, but just to tell you that there are various factors that can change, can vary for building a prototype. So the purpose is one of them, the coverage, the fidelity, we already mentioned the fidelity, law versus I versus medium, the functional completeness, the usage and the durability. Hmm? So how you use the prototype, what's the goal of the prototype that you're building, how durable is the prototype? Is something that you're going to build and throw it away, or is something that you're going to keep and to make evolving into the next stage? And the purpose as well, what's the goal of having the prototype done? Hmm? So without going into the many details of that, uh, but generally, the purpose could be about the role, the interface, or the implementation. So if you want to evaluate the role of something, uh, or if you want to evaluate a specific interaction modality, that is the interface or technical aspects of that prototype. Mm? So this could be different kind of purposes. Mm? And different prototypes can give you different mm, uh, information about these aspects. So, for instance, you cannot evaluate the implementation of technical aspects in a low fidelity prototype because you don't have the implementation yet. Instead, you can evaluate maybe the role of that prototype in some sense, or the interface, the interaction flow, the flow between the pages, the interface with other kind of prototypes. Hmm? So this could be characteristics of prototypes. And most important to the purposes could be also these. So most of the time we did a prototype, we do a prototype, either to evaluate it, to get, to get feedback for it, or to think about it, to design and to explore alternatives. Mm -hmm. So here in the slides there are basically three different way of analysis and validation, and one that is more about, so actually these in a way are all evaluation. Uh, three of them are with uh, two of them are with users, with your end users, and two of them are instead made by expert, in a way. So the first one is an expert reported here, is an expert analysis, meaning that someone that is expert of the domain or is expert of the user interface in general is analyzing your prototype with respect to some, to some rules to some guidelines, to some um, instruction, to see if the prototype is really fulfilling that uh, the goal that the prototype has. So it's an expert that do, does an analysis of it. That is similar to the second one, mm, that is checking if the prototype is following the design rules and the guidelines. Mm. This could be an expert, or this could be you, the team designing and creating the prototype that while creating, during the creation, after the creation, check what uh, you did with the rules that you will know. Hmm? You, we will speak about guidelines and design rules in the following lectures, but that could be also we did something to check if it's following the well-known rules and guidelines. And that, that rules and guidelines can be generic, like provide support, provide documentation, or could be specific, 
like in a specific platform on Windows, you have to do buttons in this way and use these colors, etc., etc., etc. So very specific information on how to follow the rules of the platform you are targeting to. Mm? And again, all of this is possible with different kind of prototypes. Mm? With, uh, with all the prototypes, you can do the expert analysis, checking with respect to specific platform. It's something that you can do with a more advanced, a more high fidelity prototype because otherwise it's, it's still too low fidelity to think about colors, to think about following the design specification of a given platform. And, and these are sort of expert or you ev evaluating the, the project. And we are going to, as, a, as I said before, we are going to speak about guidelines, rules, etc. And we also uh, are going to see two kinds of expert analysis. One is the heuristic evaluation, uh, and that is also the individual assignment that we are going to do. That is you acting as expert for another project. And so you will do this expert analysis for another project. And then we will have, for instance, other kind of evaluation with end users, with your immediate users. That could be controlled experiment or usability testing, in which you pick your, you get your end users, you put it in a room, and you have them try the application, the prototype, the system, with respect to the task that you have defined. So you give people some task and one at a time and tell them, please do the task with the prototype. And you see if they are able to do the task, how many errors they do, if they do errors, why, which are the problems, if they find everything. So this is your target users that are evaluating the usability, the usefulness, and the capability to follow the task that your prototype should fulfill. And these are said controlled because you pick people and you remove people from their context to their environment and you bring in in a room. So you control what happened in the room. You give the software, you give the task, you give the environment. So if you want to video record, you set up the, the room to do everything that you need to. So you can have full control on the experiment and evaluation. And this could be either a usability testing uh, that is more let's see if this thing is usable, or a control experiment in which you set up, uh, and we, we, we are not going to, to cover this in this course, in which you set up uh, an experiment, hmm? like I have option one and option B, and I would like to see if statistically the usage of one and the option A and option B are actually different, which is better with numbers, which statistical analysis, with that level of specificity and with a comparison between two different alternatives. Hmm? While usability testing is more, let's try this. But still, this is controlled. Or you can also have people in the wild, meaning that you give the prototype to people and say, use it for a week. And you collect data, you collect information, you speak with these people, but you don't have predefined tasks that people should do they can use the prototype freely in their daily activities in their life. And again, all of this is something that for some kind of prototypes works better and for others is not possible. So a low fidelity prototype, uh, you probably cannot do an in the wild evaluation with a low fidelity prototype because it's, as we said, as we have seen yesterday, it's typically made on paper so you you can give a piece of paper to, to one person for one week, but it's, it's not really useful. You don't really get the information that you want because it's not doing anything. It's just a different piece of paper. While a medium fidelity prototype or a high fidelity prototype can also be done for that because they already are technological tools. Hmm? So they can be more fulfilled on that. Uh, the other three with some differences can, can work for all the kind of prototype. And these are possible purposes, but there could be more, including understanding which are the design alternatives for some specific part for an entire system, as we said yesterday. And then there is durability. 
And durability is mostly split in three macro categories. Uh, that has to do on the usage, on the time span of a prototype. So we can have throwaway prototypes, we can have incremental prototypes, and we can have evolutionary prototypes. That is the next slide. Uh, so throwaway prototypes are prototypes that are used, hmm, typically low fidelity prototypes are throwaway prototypes, uh, are used to assess some quality of the system to get some information, to try something, and then discard it. Hmm? So throw away. You do a prototype, you learn something, and you throw it away, and you do another prototype. Hmm? Uh, this could be at the same level or a different level of fidelity. Uh, the incremental prototype is instead a, a prototype that is incrementally developed over time. So you develop a prototype, and then you learn something, and you then add another module, separate to that prototype, add a set of pages, and you build this prototype, and you maybe remove some pages, add some pages, and you release one step at a time in an incremental way. Hmm? So you build feature A and B, and then all page one and two, and then you build page three and four, and then you change page one. Maybe you remove page one, and you create another page one incrementally. You don't throw it away, and start from scratch, but you add pieces to that, that prototype hmm? until completion, until the next prototype, until the final product, etc. Evolutionary prototypes are instead prototypes that evolve over time and became the final product. Hmm? So you don't throw it away, you don't add pieces, you just refine every time the same prototype, and at a certain point, the, same, the very same prototype becomes the final product. Hmm? So a uh, high fidelity prototype can be easily an evolutionary prototype. If made in code, if it's a software, and it's made in code because it's easy, in a way, to bring, to evolve the prototype until you reach the final version, uh, while paper prototype is more difficult to have a low fidelity a paper prototype be evolutionary because you have a piece of paper and in the other side you have um, software. Mm? Or in the case of the Palm Pilot of yesterday, you have a piece of wood and in the other case you have electronic circuits, so it's not really something that you can evolve. Mm? But some prototype, some kind of prototype can evolve, others can um, be incrementally built and others are just made for throw it away. Again, all of these are properties that are then intersected with the fidelity and with the purpose. Mm? So you can have a throwaway prototype for devaluation, low fidelity, or you can have a throwaway prototype, high fidelity, for exploring some design alternatives. Mm? So you put all of this together according to the goal that you want to achieve with that specific step of prototyping. Fidelity, we already seen that, uh, partially. Mm -hmm. This is another example of fidelity. Mm -hmm. So, this one is a, how level, which level of fidelity it has? Low fidelity. This one, yeah, this one could be also the final product, actually, not, not, not necessarily high. Mm -hmm. and, and what you see is that in this, low fidelity prototype, you can see two things. First one is that everything, mostly everything, that is in this low fidelity prototype is actually also in the high fidelity prototype. And you can understand, even in this low fidelity prototype, what this is about. What can you do? Hmm? So you can select the paper size. This is a preview. You, you get it, even if it's not in this polished form, and, and you have three buttons, and pressing these buttons, something will happen, probably another piece of paper will, will arrive. Hmm? So you get the full picture already. You understand what's the purpose, you understand what you can click, set, and what's the goal of every small parts. Hmm? Exactly as here, that you 
can understand the same things because they are the same information. But the difference, the other difference, is that this one, uh, so th this one is probably the page setup of Windows XP, something like that. Uh, probably Windows 11 doesn't have this page setup anymore, it's slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is exactly the version made for a specific software in that version. Mm -hmm. Maybe it lasts some years, but it's specifically for that software. And it's not for Linux, and it's not for macOS, because they, they look differently. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have more or less the same information, but they look differently. Mm. So these say to you, Windows. Mm. Because it's, it's the look and feel of Windows. This doesn't tell you anything about a look and feel specifically. You can, everybody can pick this and implement it in any, wo in any way that this person wants with any graphics, for any operating systems, mm, you are not, you don't see Windows behind it. You see a print screen, a page setup screen. Mm. So if you are designing this, and then a person needs to do a high fidelity prototype of this, the high fidelity prototype can be done for macOS, can be done for Windows, can be done for Linux, can be done for Android can be done in diff can be done in different ways, and this is not prescribing which ways. Mm? And if you use this for having people look at it, mm? and even if you pick nobody with Windows experience, they will still be able to understand this, and they cannot comment on colors, on oh, this is, doesn't look like Windows as expected, etc. because this is just black and white, essentially, done without the right distances, done without the right font, etc. It's just a representation, a very, very low fidelity representation of what you want to do. Hmm? These, again, instead tell you this is Windows, because in other operating system will look totally different or sort of different, okay? So also the information that is conveyed is different according to the fidelity. Not, also, not only the quality of things, so clearly this is not a straight line as, as this, but also the information that implicitly a piece of prototype convey to you. Mm -hmm. Again, this is Windows, this is whatever could be. It's not, it's not in the image. It's not something you can get on the image. If you don't see this, you cannot know what is this. If I put here the equivalent on another operating system, that is the equivalent, we, we can say, okay, this wasn't for Windows, this was for X, hmm? whatever is X. So even this kind of information are implicitly passed to a person. And again, to a person, if you want to evaluate it, clearly you get different information, but also if you want to check with respect to guidelines, you get different information, because here you have more general guidelines, and here you can also follow the design principle of Windows application. How a Windows application should work, which are the distance, the button as made in this way with this shade of, et cetera, that here you don't have. You here also have buttons that are one smaller than the other because they are drawn by hand. So all this information is also something that the fidelity convey, that you choose to convey or not choose to convey with the prototype by the same fact that you have that kind of fidelity in a prototype. Okay, so low fidelity prototypes. That subtitle is how to start using an application month before implementing it. Mm -hmm. So for low fidelity prototype, we mostly mean paper prototype. So prototype that you pick a piece of paper, a pen, 
digital you're not, but and drawn, and draw a user interface in a way that is similar hmm, to the one that we have seen before for the print, the page setup screen. And it's the user interface for the main features, for the main, to solve the main task of a, at least to solve the main task of an, uh, an application of a specific domain made on different piece of paper hmm? uh, of varying size. So here, for instance, there is an example. Um, actually, these are, not, these are all no paper, but not, low not all low fidelity. So this is, a, this is the first two are low fidelity prototypes of a smartphone application. And they build also a smartphone hmm? uh, to, to resemble, to just give the, the right size on the screen. And not only, also to allow scrolling so this piece of paper is higher than the screen, so when it's put here, you can scroll, meaning move the piece of paper. So show only the information that are needed in that moment. So the person can scroll, and actually you can scroll the page by moving the piece of paper. Uh, the, these other three are still on paper, but higher fidelity, because you have colors, you have details, everything is more um, uh, equally spashed and you have background color, you have details on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the sentences, et cetera. Hmm? So this is still on paper, but we are now focusing on the paper prototype for low fidelity. So more of the first two kind of prototype. So which are the key feature of paper prototype? Uh, so they should be, they must be interactive. Hmm? So it's not one screen that you put there and see. But they are sketches of screen appearance, more than one. And this paper that represents the, the overall screen, so let me see if I have a bigger picture, I don't. Um, so like this, so screens, entire screens. And you can also have, hmm, I don't know if it's very visible here, but this one, for instance, is something that you put on top of it. Hmm? So you can also have not only the screens, but also pieces of paper that show the interaction, show what happens. When I click a button and a model appear, well, the model is a separate piece of paper that appear, that should appear on the screen. Hmm? That's why they are interactive. When you press a button, the screen should disappear and another screen should appear, like in a, in a non-paper prototype. If you open a menu, that menu should open. And so you should see the entire menu open it, hmm? et cetera. So that is one of the key features. It's not just a screen that is static and a serial screen that you put on the table and a person look at all the screens, but it should be, you see one screen at a time and after clicking on something or tapping on something, the screen change. Clearly it doesn't change magically, but there is a person that changed a piece of paper for you, hmm? acting as the computer in a way. So they, they must be interactive paper mock-up. Screens plus pieces of the screen. The interaction is natural, hmm? so it doesn't resemble the real interaction that you have. So everything is tapping with a finger. If you have the mouse click, if you have a touch screen, it doesn't matter, it's always a finger tapping. Hmm? So you cannot really know about the precision of the selection, but you can investigate, as we said yesterday, more about the interaction, the flow between pages. And also typing could be Often could be writing, hmm? or could be you, you show a keyboard on screen, if it's, for instance, a, a mobile phone, a, a piece of paper representing a keyboard, but then when the, this person type on the keyboard, it's, you cannot make the right letter appear in that moment, so it's, it's like writing. If you need to have the exact sentences that this person is writing in your prototype. Hmm? Uh, it's low fidelity, in look and feel, 
because clearly it doesn't assemble the really a well done, complete user interface, but it's high fidelity in depth, is high fidelity in how it works. Meaning that if you have somebody that needs to, to test, to try your paper prototype, this tester will see one page, one screen of your paper prototype, and another person, like one of you, will be the computer. Hmm? So we'll put down and pick up a piece of paper. We'll present the right response to the person. So if I press OK and I need to change page, this person will change page. If I press uh, show the, the keyboard, this person will bring to me the keyboard so that I can type. Hmm? So provide all the animation, all the interactions, hmm? so acting actually as the computer, hmm? where you click something, something happened, this something happened is a person moving pieces of paper around. Hmm? So it's high fidelity in how it works because it's, it's actually working for, for real, in a sense, but instead of having a computer, you just have a person doing all the changes. Hmm? Sometimes, in some cases, more intelligently than a computer because a person can, can know better. Hmm? So how you build uh, a paper prototype? We go back to the kindergarten and you find the material you need. So you need papers, you need mm, mm, pens, marker, post-it, uh, scotch, glues, all the things that you can, can use for draw something. You can also do it on, uh, um, on a tablet hmm? uh, with a pen, but always hands free. So not using any software specifically. Open a digital piece of paper, pick a pen for that digital device and draw by hand hmm? in black and white mostly. Hmm? So you can do it with physical paper, you could do it with digital paper, but in any case, it must be done and drawn and uh, one screen at a time. Mm? And you can also use photocopies. Mm? You have the same model to repeat four times. You just do it once and then you do photocopy for that. And you print four times if needed. Uh, you can also use stencil or usable UI components. Maybe there are keyboards. You can find on, on the internet some predefined keyboards in black and white uh, for smartphone, for instance, and you can print them out mm, as standard components instead of designing, mm, instead of drawing an actual keyboard for smartphone on your own. Mm, so you can also use this for facilitating the standard components, clearly not for the, the key features of the key components of your application that will be personalized by you according to what you want to put it inside. Mm. So material paper, pens, scissors, glue, scotch, all, all these things. Um, why paper prototype in general and in particular? Well, in general, is fast. So sketching a user interface is always faster than programming or using a computer to create the same user interface because you, don't, you don't, don't have to be precise. You just draw a, squ a square and that is your screen. You draw a square and write okay and that is your button. One second or less. Mm -hmm. uh, in any software, you have to pick the buttons, drag and drop, and then they are not aligned, and then you have to double click on the button and write okay on it, and then save. So it's, 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 it's not fast. It's not, it's not as fast as doing by hand. Hmm? And clearly, you, you lose in fidelity, but it's, it's part of the game. Hmm? Uh, it's easier to change. Hmm? So it's easy to throw away a part of the paper prototype. It's a piece of paper. You pick the piece of paper and throw it in the, in the trash bin, and you start again. Uh, and there is no investment in code, in software, in anything, because it's just a piece of paper with a pen. Mm -hmm. So if you make a mistake, you can throw it away and do it again. Three seconds after, you are up or running again. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's easy to make changes, 
between one test and another, between one page and another, or you forgot to write okay in a button, well, let me fix it. Let me write okay in that button, I just forgot it. Hmm? Or I forgot one button, let me draw it. And one second after, you have the button. Hmm? And you can do it everywhere. Hmm? Uh, Non-programmers can help. Hmm? That is because kindergarten skills are the ones that are required for a paper prototype. Hmm? So if you are actually in a design team in which you want to create a user interface or you are in a startup, hmm? a paper prototype can be done by everybody, hmm? even if they know anything uh, know nothing about programming, about computers, about tools, just, they need just a piece of paper and a pen and the ability to draw something more or less squared. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a skill that everybody has. So it's really easy to access and to create a paper prototype for everybody independently from the skill. Mm -hmm. So if you are in a multidisciplinary team, you can have also people from economy or people also, you can use paper prototype in co-designing structures in which you have end user helping you designing with you because it's actually a matter of drawing on a piece of paper. Hmm? And the great benefit of paper prototype more than the others is that it's focused the attention on, on the interactions, modalities as we said, but also on the, picture, the big pictures. You don't waste time on details. People don't waste time looking at the details. Uh, and typically people, when as something that is low fidelity, they are more creati creative uh, instead of having a high fidelity or a mid fidelity prototype. Because in the high fidelity prototype, everything is precise. So everything should be aligned. The colors should be carefully chosen. And so if you show as a first example, of user interface, something with colors, with precision, etc. most of the comments will be about the color, about the alignment, about the font size, about the font choice, etc. and then also other things. But that will be there. With paper prototype, you skip all these comments because you don't have colors, you don't have font size, you don't have any of that. You have, it, it's evident for everybody that is done by hand and that the dimension of, this, of, of the words cannot be the same along the entire prototype because it's made by hand. Hmm? So you clearly cannot learn about font size and colors, but people are not distracted by those details. And so you can learn really about the big picture, about if it's working, about the flow between pages, about interaction modalities, etc. And once that that are the foundation are set, you can, in a subsequent prototype, investigate more in a higher fidelity prototype, investigate about colors, fonts, etc. Hmm? But not with paper prototypes. So this is the big advantage of paper prototype, another big advantage on paper prototype. And here there are two examples of paper prototypes. Uh, one is sort of a tablet version, and also they design the create the, the container is not mandatory. You can also not have it, but it gives you um, a feeling of something that's more real. Uh, the second one is made by, with stencil. Mm, so they have the stencil in which they draw uh, already the things, but always paper and by hand. And this third one is, uh, so you see an example in which you can also see the, um, the other pieces. So these are the screens, but you can also have these pieces that you can put on these screens, also this one, according to the action that this u the user does. And this was for smartphone, and this was a project of last year course, hmm? uh, a paper prototype that students did last year. Hmm? So it's, it's really simple, it's really childish how uh, to do this, but it, it works in the end, because it's, it's fast and it's simple to do. Hmm? Uh, so even just to make a more concrete example that is not us, even Microsoft. Hmm? When they had to redesign the terminal tab bar, the first thing they did was a sort of paper prototype. Hmm? So this is the new tab bar 
of the terminal bar that was just the terminal, the tab bar, so not the entire terminal, with some notes that they have, but the first thing they did was take a piece of paper and draw it to understand what to put where and what to write and why they're there with some questions, some knowledge for their own, for their own reflection, so this is not part of a paper prototype, but even in that case, the, first, the very first version was not something in code, but something made on a piece of paper. Because it's easier, faster, easier to discuss with others. What do you think? Three seconds after you have something to show. Hmm? Instead, if you have to open Photoshop, you, in three seconds you just open Photoshop, probably. Okay, so even the company is not just something that we, we do in an um, academic setting. And here there is an example of how you create interactivity. This is sophisticated, hmm? so you can do things sophisticated like this. Uh, this is very, very well planned, but it's not mandatory to do that. You can also be less sophisticated. So this is about uh, a male client. So you see that the person tap on something and another person put the, the new screen that is male composition. Then the person tap again and this is a sophisticated part. So the, 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 the window open, so they open it because there was the uh, hidden carbon copy, so it's more options, so they do it in a way that it can be opened instead of putting another piece of paper on top. Mm? They just collapse it. So open these options. And then you click, I don't know what, and probably attachment. And you can select the attachment. You select the attachment, okay. And you open another piece that is the attachment that was added in that way. Mm? And again, they could also have changed all this part but they knew which were the task, because that was designed to support some tasks, so they knew that they had to put an attachment, and so they were ready with the option for detachment. Hmm? It was just in the same piece of paper in that case, but it could be, that is why this is sophisticated, but it could also be another piece of paper to put on top of it, etc. Hmm? So now it's, I don't know what it was. Ah, it's in the bottom. And probably send email at a certain point, and email is sent. Mm -hmm. Then open an email, etc. And a new piece of paper. So this is how you you try and test a paper prototype. So this was all prepared. Mm -hmm. You know, again, quite sophisticated way in that sense, because they were planning exactly open these, open that part, etc. And by default they're closed. And so one probably the one that's using is like the intermediate user or an expert that is the one to do an evaluation, and the other one instead is, is the one acting as the computer, maybe also part, probably part of the design team, because they need to know how to move things around, what to open, which is the right piece of paper to show it in that specific moment, uh, what happens if there is an error of it click something that shouldn't be clicked, you need to, to make decisions, so this person needs to know very well how, which are the various pieces to be used together. Mm -hmm. So this is a paper prototype, uh, essentially. And now we are stuck in the video, okay. Um, and that one that we have seen, but also this one, are ways to create a dynamic screen. Mm -hmm. So here there are screens for probably scrolling or for horizontally scrolling or for keeping the flow. So instead of um, putting pieces of paper on top of it, uh, this team decided to just have something that they can move on the left and the right. So if I click here in book session, the computer will just uh, pull on the right or on the left until here in the middle will appear the right screen. Mm? And same things here. Mm? According to what you do, so slide to unlock, you slide, you see here, and then 
after this 15% complete, you have 20% complete. So they already have everything in place. And also they did the same for the, um, the smartwatch, hmm, which you can move hmm, not horizontally, but vertically and pick one screen. Hmm, so this is also useful for scrolling on a page, not only for changing screen. Hmm. Uh, the disadvantage of this, made in this way and show in this way, is that a person can see what happens before and after. So it has a preview of what happens. Hmm? Uh, and, and can influence, if it's an evaluation, it can influence the evaluation because you can have a peak preview of what happened next or before. And so you have more information that you usually have. Uh, so what, what sometimes is, if you want to, to go this, this route, what sometimes is done is just covering the other part mm, uh, enough not to have the person that is testing to understand what is in it, but enough for you to understand how to move it correctly mm, so that the person is just focusing on this single screen. This is for the evaluation. If it's instead an internal evaluation, internal of the group, that it's fine because you already know all the screens. Hmm? So if it's for testing for you, it's fine. Uh, for scrolling, there is less of a problem because it's typically you don't scroll so much. You, you scroll one single screen, you don't have four or five screens differently. Hmm? So this is a way to do dynamic screens, hmm? similar to the one in the video. So how to test the paper prototype? We will spend a little bit more on this, but just to give you a preview, um, so you have, you must have tasks for the people to be done. People that will test the prototype, one at a time, and then the design team, that could be the project team, that can cover up to three different roles. One is mandatory, that is the computer the one that moved the piece of paper, that simulate the prototype. And it, uh, this person acts as the computer. So it doesn't speak, just move piece of paper around like a computer would do. And then you have other two actors that could be also the same person if you don't have enough people. Uh, one is the facilitator and the other one is the observer. The facilitator is the one that presents the interface, presents the task to the user, one task at a time, and help user in a way to stay on track, hmm, to follow with the test. So this is the first task, do this. And then this is the second task, do this. So it's facilitating the session. And the third one is the observer. That is just observing what happens without interfering like in an observation for need finding. So it's there, silent, look at what happens, look at what the, the tester say, look what the facilitators say, uh, and keep notes. Take note of everything that works and not works, etc. Hmm? So it's just there to observe and take notes of what happens. Hmm? So basically, to test a paper prototype, you need for sure a computer, you need for sure a facilitator, an observer, the facilitator could also be the observer, a little bit much work for, it, for him or for her, but it's doable. And then you have some people that test the prototype. Again, they could be expert or could be the target or immediate users of your, um, of your, of your prototype or your system. Hmm? And then one task at a time, you, you go on and see what happens if they are able to do the task. And uh, how well if they tap something that they shouldn't because they, they didn't find the options. Hmm? So all of this is something that can help you to change the design to understand what is working, what is not. So what you can learn from a paper prototype, for instance, from a test of a letter prototype, you can learn the conceptual model of the prototype. Does people understand it? Is people able to use it? And at which degree? Uh, functionality to do a specific task or to do a series of tasks. 
it has what is needed, there are some features that are essential that are missing or not. Uh, you can explore navigation, hmm, connect it to the model, can, can use a find, how to do things. If I ask you in a paper prototype, book uh, an exam at Polytechnico, can, can user able to, to, to find the right button to click on the paper prototype until completion of the, of the booking procedure or they, st they stop before and say, oh, I've done, when it's not done yet. So this is something you can learn from that. Uh, terminology, are all the wording that I am using appropriate, understandable, suitable for the domain, and screen content. I put everything that I needed on a single screen and not too much and not too less, or not. So all these things are things that you can learn to edit the prototype and to move forward. You cannot learn everything else on the other side. You cannot le le learn about the look, colors, fonts, white space, space between elements, etc. because you, you didn't have that precisely. You cannot learn efficiency. You cannot learn the response time of a system, of a user interface, because the response time is the, the time that the computer person take to, piece, to pick a piece of paper and put it on it and it will be always that time. So you cannot, if you have a complex algorithm in a real product, that is always a person moving things around. So you cannot learn about the response time. You cannot learn about efficiency. You cannot learn about small changes. Because in a paper prototype, even the smallest change is actually a big change, is shown as big change. Because in, 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 if in a prototype, in a fidelity prototype, um, I don't know, um, a notification appear, or a button change color, or something like that, or a button change the word, in a paper prototype, it will be a person getting the new button and putting it on screen in front of you. So you notice that there is a change because you, there is a person that picks something and put it in front of you, or open a piece of paper. So th even the small change, the small word change, it will be automatically in a software. Here it involves a person moving things around. So you will notice it because you will see a person moving. Mm -hmm. So the small changes will be always noted because they are actually big changes in a way. Mm -hmm. There is no difference here between changing a button or changing a screen. There will be always a person moving things around. Um, and you cannot learn a lot about exploration with deliberation because with paper prototype, people um, are more deliberate, so they try to, to move around to fulfill the goal and not explore the, the prototype, not explore the user interface because they understand that it is something draft, it is something preliminary. So they not explore it to understand what is in the in the user interface, they just do the work without exploring, without trying other things. This doesn't happen in the medium and the high fidelity prototype, where people is more, is typically more exploratory than not deliberate. Hmm? So things that you cannot learn here, you can, you can learn them in other level of fidelities and vice versa. In other level of fidelity, it's harder to learn some of these things that instead you can learn with paper prototype. Uh, then there is, very quickly, another example of paper prototypes, sort of, that's called the video prototype, that essentially is a prototype, low fidelity, but put it inside a video uh, without, so with a story, like in a storyboard, but a video storyboard, uh, with, so let me go where this person is actually using the prototype, when you see the person using the prototype like a real prototype, so you don't see ends of people doing stuff, it just, you see just the frame in which the person is actually using the prototype, using the software. So it's still a paper prototype, in this case it's colored, uh, but it's made for video purpose, not for uh, testing with users, so just to show 
how a prototype would work without implementing it and putting it in a video hmm, to make a point on what an application can do. And here there is another example uh, that you can, you can see if you want. Um, and, and clearly video prototype could be low fidelity, medium fidelity, or high fidelity, depending on the kind of, um, of information that you want and the time you have to spend. Because the outcome of this is not video, a prototype to test, but it's a video to show people to get feedback. Hmm? So the outcome is actually the video. But you can also do it with papers or with more sophisticated prototype. And to create a video prototype, you more or less follow the same things that you would follow with the storyboard. You, have a, you need to have a story. You need to have an outline. So you can start from a storyboard to create a video prototype. And then you need to have a prototype also of some kind of the application of the system. And then you need to have video recording material, music, and you have to choose users, the location going around. So that the, the video that we have seen uh, was by in a university campus. So you have to, to go in a university campus and make a recording, etc. But again, the goal is showing a video of the prototype that fulfill a story, that fulfill a goal, that enables some task in a message where the message that the video has is more important than the quality of the production of the video. You want to focus more on the message that you are going to, to say. And clearly this is, with a paper prototype, it's cheap and fast. Uh, you can communicate quickly because you can put it on YouTube and say, please watch this and tell me, answer this survey, this questionnaire about this prototype. What do you think? Mm? So it's easier to, to reach a lot of people. You can also put one of these videos inside a survey if you want to have feedback about something specifically. So it's another way to build prototypes, not physical prototypes, but not prototypes that people can test, but only prototypes that people can show, can see, and understand how it works and give opinions or reflect on the usefulness of the prototype for, for them, actually. Next, medium fidelity prototype. So medium fidelity prototype are a step further uh, in which they are medium fidelity or even high fidelity in look and feel, but not in the usage. Hmm? So differently from the paper prototype in which we have a low fidelity in look and, in look and feel, but now high fidelity now they operate because there was a person that were able, given unlimited piece of paper, the person can simulate everything. Uh, with a medium fidelity prototype, you have a computer. You have a software performing the, the operations and you are not using code. So what you can do is limited in functionality in that sense. And it's also time consuming to cover everything much more than doing a paper prototype. So um, it's the first stage of a computer prototype in which you can have a software that renders the user interface, accept some inputs, and respond by changing pages automatically. So every time I press this button, I will go to that page, no matter what I did before, hmm? no matter which information I put in a form, it's just going that page with some other pre-filled information. I cannot move information from one page to the other, for instance, while I can do in a paper prototype. Because if I have the person write something, I can move this piece of paper in the next one. And I have the information with me. Uh, they are also known as mockups and wireframe interface. Um, they can represent single screens put together with some more animation than the paper prototype. Um, sometimes uh, the drawing is not very, very precise, but it's not really a strict requirement. Um, it's not really precise, the drawing, even if it's done with a computer, because they want to convey the message that the design is still preliminary. And for the reason, the same reason, they are typically grayscale or black and white. So without color again. Hmm? 
So there is some kind of medium fidelity prototype that are also colored, but we are focusing more on the one that doesn't have color so that only the high fidelity prototype has the one that color it. Uh, and they use static information, predefined pages, and they follow, since they're made of computer, they follow specifically the right size of what you expect in an interface. Mm? So here, you have alignment, you have the right size of the buttons, so all the buttons should be the same, like in a real user interface. And you also see here that the lines are better than the one that you end draw, but still comics-like, so not really so precise as in, the, in a product or a final prospect. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an example of a medium fidelity prototype in one of the tools that enable it to create it. In this case, this is a wireframe uh, in which you see something that you didn't have before, like shades of gray, products is the one selected. Um, buttons, all the same. There is a search that looks like a proper search. You still don't have text. You don't know exactly what is this product. You can have a text, but in this case, they decided not to have. This is a web application, because you see a browser. And this is an image. You don't have an image, in a, typically in a medium fidelity prototype. You have these things that say, this is a placeholder for an image. Because images are typically color red, and you don't want to have colors here, so. And what happens in this tool, that you have some option here, so you can drag and drop pieces of the user interface, and I can enable this button to bring me in another screen. Or I can enable these tabs to show me what happens if I click on it. And you click on it. So, in this case, most of this case, you bring everything on a mouse-based interaction, even if it's not for mouse, hmm? for, even if for a smartphone. Hmm? And clearly, you rely, in this case, with design libraries, in which you already have the components, you drag and drop, you don't have to draw all, all the buttons, you drag and drop a, pro, a template of a button, and you personalize it with the information that you, you need. You change the label, for instance. You make it bigger, smaller, etc., and you have all the kind of information. Hmm? So this is, for instance, is the map that is color red because the component is color red, so it's fine. But it, it's a map. You you don't actually see a real map. You say, okay, there there should be a map showing something that the rest of the page will convey. And you can have some tools here for medium fidelity prototype. Here there are just three of them. Um, probably some, somebody already used Balsamic in other courses. Um, the screenshot before was taken by mockups, and, but there is also Figma that is widely popular and was acquired by Adobe a few weeks ago and as an educational license that will give you the full access to the, the software for free. Uh, differently from the others. And when we are going to you to do a medium fidelity prototype, we will tell you to use Figma, and we will do a lecture about an exercise, let's say, about Figma before doing the medium fidelity prototype. So that's why there is this star here. And Figma is working well for medium fidelity prototype up to high fidelity prototype without code. So it enables you to create also something with colors, with a very high fidelity. We will use it just for the medium fidelity. But as a tool, we will allow you to reach the high fidelity prototype clearly without using, so without, without coding, without programming, just on the interface part, while our high fidelity prototype will be in code. And well, here there is uh, an example actually with Balsamic in which you see, you can see that all these are just screens, so you move from one screen to another according to what you click or tap on it. Hmm? So if you click on this button, you move here, and if you click on this other button, move maybe here, etc. Hmm? So you just represent screens, full screens, connected with paths between the different screens. 
Mm -hmm. So a button will open another screen. A link will open another screen. Mm -hmm. So you, and you have to manually connect all the buttons that you want to make enable with all the screens that you want to have. Mm -hmm. So you cannot cover everything because it will take a lot of time, but again, the fundamental task should be there and the fundamental function and feature should be there. And you can also do interactive mockups with PowerPoint if you want. Mm? That's an alternative. These two are made with PowerPoint, for instance, mm? which you can bring animation and change slide. Each slide is a different screen, and you can change the slide programmatically. Um, so the drawbacks of generally all this tool is that you click on things, you don't interact. There is no text entry, there is no data entry, there is no real selection of data. You see options, you click on the third one, but the default one was the first and you get the first, always. Mm -hmm. There is no sharing of information between screens. Things are not active in this sense. Path are statics. You always go from screen one to screen two, if that is the path you set up, no matter what you did in the beginning, in the middle. And sometimes the tester is engaged in a game that is hunt for the hotspot. So since not everything will be clickable, they will try to find what is the things clickable instead of focusing on the task. Mm -hmm. um, so this is good for testing and understanding the workflow generally, because if they want to click something that is not clickable, then probably they, didn't, are, they aren't doing the task very well. Uh, but it's not really good for the behavior because they then try to found the clickable elements instead of focusing on the task itself in some cases. Mm -hmm. But this is a drawback of all these tools because they are low fidelity in behavior in a way mm -hmm. with this static path. And then finally, high fidelity prototype. That could be done with the tools that we have seen before but also could be done in, in code. But they are still prototypes, hmm? not final product. They are much more expensive to build. You have to handle graphics, colors, fonts, layouts, all of these that you didn't have before. And when tested, people will focus more on these things, as we said before, because the representation that this high fidelity product gives is about the representation of a final product, something finished, while the medium and the low fidelity Communicate, I'm not done. C is still preliminary. The high fidelity prototype communicate, it's, it's the final version. It's polished. It's the well done version of everything. Hmm? So you can learn a lot about these items here and, and then you need to, to learn about general behavior of the prototype in others, uh, prototype, in other level of fidelities. Hmm? So this is an example on high fidelity prototype without code. And you see, it's actually looking as a real thing. You have colors, you have buttons. If it's not done in code, you will still have static links, but static path. And if you have done in code, you have to, to program the behaviors of each buttons, like here. So it's more time consuming, but also you have colors, you have details, you have everything in place that is needed. So you can do high fidelity prototype with tools like Figma, for instance. So here there are some other tools that are no code tools. So like Figma, you can drag and drop things. And Figma is still here. Uh, but you can also do it in code. For instance, with web technology, for instance. So what we can learn from a high fidelity interactive prototype, we can learn the layout. Everything is, people can find important elements, the layout is clear, it's distracted, there are too many things, there are too many colors, too, too few colors, etc. Uh, colors, fonts, icon, pictures, etc. are well chosen or not. They are creating confusion, they are distracting or helping the user do the task that they need to do. Um, do users notice the small changes? This is something here you can learn. 
because here you don't have a person moving things around. So do user notice and response to the status bar notification, to messages, to change in the cursor size, to any other kind of feedback, a button that becomes inactive or becomes active? Is it something that they notice or not? Here you can see that. In the medium fidelity prototype, some of these things, you can see them and not at all in the low fidelity prototype. And here you can also start seeing some efficiency issues, especially if you do it in code. Um, efficiency meaning performance, but also meanings, uh, are controls big enough or buttons are too close together so that every time you want to click cancel, I click okay, because they are too close each other's. Uh, the list in which I need to scroll is too long. Should I have a way to search the list because it's too long or not? All these things are things that you can learn from high fidelity because you have more realistic data than in the previous prototype. And don't forget that here hmm, we don't have all the text in place. So we, we don't know yet if, if we have a list of countries, we will probably put five countries, 10 countries in a medium fidelity prototype. In a high fidelity prototype, maybe we have all the countries because we get them from a database. And so we can put it automatically, the list, but then we have 200 countries in a list and we should probably provide a way to, for the people to interact with those lists. Could be ordering, could be filtering, could be search, could be something. So all of this is something you can learn with an high fidelity prototype. Um, and if you want, there is a, a video. I'm not playing it now, but that is, uh, was made, I think, in 2015 or something like that uh, by Apple, by the design team of Apple. And it was a presentation in the, com in the developer conference that was called Prototyping, Fake It Till You Make It and start by presenting an high fidelity prototype of a fictionary application for iPhone, and then show how to build it in Zwift or Objective-C, that is not really important probably for us, but the idea of prototyping is still, this is an high fidelity prototype in code, the, the idea of prototyping is, um, is also present in industries like Google and Apple, and this is a, a clear example. And if you want, it's just three minutes at the beginning of the video. They um, exaggerate a little bit. They start to say, I'm introducing the outstanding novel and disruptive application for, and you are going to see the video to, to see what it's for. Um, but they're also mocking a little bit the, the actual presentation of products that Apple does. And these are Apple people, so um, they are internal to the company. So this is three minutes video, you can, if you want, you can, you can watch it. Um, and, and next week, so this is close, the, the three levels of prototype. There is another technique that is used for prototyping that we are going to discuss, not today, but just the last one. That has nothing to, that has partially nothing to do with the fidelity of prototype, it's just another technique. Always to prototype, so to fake a technology or to fill in it with missing or not existent technology that's called the Wizard of Oz technique that will be a topic not for Monday because it's holiday, not for Tuesday because it's holiday, so for in two weeks, basically, we will speak about um, this technique. If you have any question, I will still be here for a while. Otherwise, have a good lunch.